You're listening to Left Up the Valley 2.0, Atheist, Skeptic, and Humanist Radio. All right, our next guest is a professor of sociology at University of Victoria. He is a snappy dresser and snazzy dancer, Professor Edward Hodge. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, it's my pleasure. If you say that now, but you might be regaining in 60 minutes. <laughs> uh, professor Hodge, uh, people might not, it's your first time on the show, so people don't know you. Uh, maybe you'd be so kind to give us a quick bio as to who Edwin Hodge is. Sure. So uh, I, uh, I teach in the Department of Sociology at uh, UVic. Uh, I'm also a uh, research fellow at the Center for Global Studies, uh, also at, uh, at, at UVic. Um, primarily, I look at uh, radicalization, extremism, uh, and conspiratorial ideologies, but I also do research uh, in border theory, border studies, uh, and gender. I think I think you and Professor Joel back in, at the UBC are going to become two of our favorite guests here. I think we're going to have to bring you back on a regular basis, Professor <laughs> Hart. <laughs> and he's obviously a lot smarter than, than either one of us here, down here. Uh, so... Um, I guess today we are talking about sovereign citizens or naturalized people or free men on the lamb or whatever you want to call them. Uh, take us into a deep dive into this, Professor. How does how did this idea ever come about? It's like a lot of of these sort of conspiratorial beliefs. It comes out of places that you really wouldn't think. Uh, you really wouldn't think to, to sort of find uh, conspiracy theories. The sovereign citizen movement, as best we understand it, uh, really got its start in uh, the collapse of the agricultural industry in the United States in the early 1980s. Mm. Um, there was this period of time after the election of Ronald Reagan, where Reagan was really heavily informed by this belief that uh, that the, the business of government is to get out of the way of business. And so he... Uh, he passed a few really interesting, uh, you know, laws or uh, executive orders. But one of the most Im important was he uh, actually broke the back of a labor strike uh, among air traffic controllers, which, again, doesn't sound like something that would create a conspiracy theory. But the result was that other big industries all around the United States realized they were now in an environment where they could break the back of labor as well. And so what you started seeing were policies that were designed to specifically help businesses and specifically harm small, like employers and workers. And one of the hardest hit areas for this was the farming industry. Farmers uh, all across the, the US, uh, we're talking about not like agribusiness or Monsanto or anything. We're talking about like mom and dad farmers, you know, these little mom and pop kind of uh, uh, farms that had anywhere from 20, 30 head of cattle to, you know, to, to a few hundred head of cattle, uh, small feedlots, that sort of thing, and, uh, and small, uh, like, cereal and uh, uh, grain farmers. These policies wiped them out. Uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, the prices of seeds, the prices of, of, of animals, the prices of, uh, of, of maintenance, all, everything went through the roof. They weren't able to fight back, uh, and so they collapsed, and their farms started to collapse one by one. Thousands and thousands of farmers across the United States losing their their jobs, their livelihood, but also losing their homes that had been in their families for, for you know, in some cases, centuries, right, for generations. So this, this period of, of sociologically, we call this a period of social and economic disruption, uh, where people begin to lose their footing, they lose their mooring, they lose, uh, they lose their, their, you know, their livelihood, they lose everything that is a part of their identity. And they started looking, farmers all over the place, started looking around to try to find some way of fighting back. Now, now they couldn't hire lawyers, right? These are broke, they're bankrupt, they're, their farms are gone. So they can't, they can't fight back. They can't uh, go after these big agribusiness companies because, uh, you know, what are they going to do? So increasingly, they started turning to fringe, uh, sort of fringe personalities. In Canada, uh, they they came to call themselves gurus, but in the United States they started calling themselves things like constitutional activists or uh, tax code activists, uh, and they began to sort of move in these fractured, disrupted, desperate circles, selling a product. And the product was, you pay me money, and I will teach you how to get your life back. 
And the yeah. way that they they constructed their arguments, the way they, they sort of put it together was they said, listen, you know who took, you know who caused all this to happen, right? It was laws passed by the government, the federal government. Well, do you know who, you know, they're illegitimate. That government is in the pocket of big business. It's in the pocket of internationalists. Uh, therefore, it's illegal. And so what they did to you is illegal. And so they actually owe you restitution. And so they began to sell this idea um, that was very popular to very desperate people. Uh, and that's actually sort of where this all started was, was in tax rebellions. I, that, that's amazing because I do recall, and this is over 10 years ago, I did receive an email about somebody telling me that uh, along the same lines, you know, for, for a fee, he could show me how to manipulate the law. And he told me, this, this for example, he says, when you write your name, you write like capital K, small E, V, I, N. But he says, yep. when you receive a letter from the government, it's all in block, big, bold, uh, black, uh, uh, big letters. He said, that's not a person. That's, 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 they were saying, that Kevin Francis is an entity, a corporation. You're a different person than that. And anyway, it was very convoluted, but there was a price to pay for it. I think, I think you wanted like 10% of my rules earning for the year or something like that. To, to, show, me, yeah, to show me how to do this. And I'm surprised to hear that this started only in the 80s with Ronald Reagan. I thought it was much older of a movement. There's there's long been been elements that, that sort of blend into it, right? So the, the tax protest, kind of the notion that the government is this tyrannical and in fact illegitimate entity, um, that started in the 80s. But there's other movements that are that emerged earlier that have sort of welded themselves to this. One of those movements is what we call the Posse Comitatus movement. And the Posse Comitatus movement is this, this idea that, so back in the, in the Old West, right? In the Old West, uh, lawmen were few and far between. But the, the government of the day passed a law called the Posse Comitatus Act. And the Posse Comitatus Act allowed duly appointed lawmakers to effectively create a posse, which were, they, they were legally authorized lawmen for so long as they were required, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were armed, sort of almost a paramilitary organization under the direction of a sheriff, right? Of a county sheriff or a, or a city sheriff who could then direct them to, to uh, uh, you know, enact the law or to, to bring justice. That temporary act, deputies. sorry? Temporarily deputized. Yeah, exactly. They became temporary deputies. Um, and so when back in the old spaghetti westerns, if, if someone was like, we're going to get a posse, well, that was like a quasi legal thing. And so that act also made its way into conspiratorial circles where especially uh, uh, militiamen and white supremacists said, oh, yeah, see right there, posse comitatus. Uh, it's totally legit for us to have like a, a body of armed men. Uh, going out and, for example, patrolling the Arizona desert uh, to look for illegals. Um, and this is the justification that they used. Well, sovereign citizens, they blended this tax protest anti-federal government policy with the Posse Comitatus Act, with this Posse Comitatus movement, and created this kind of, and a few other strands as well, but the end result is this movement that believes that the only legitimate source of government is basically the county level, maybe even the municipal level, that it is directly pulled from the constitution, that judge-made law in, you know, at, uh, at the federal and state level are illegitimate, um, and that they, as citizens, are sovereign in themselves, right? They don't belong to anybody. And as such, they can create uh, uh, grand juries, which they, they claim that they do this all the time. They um, issue judgments against lawyers and judges and city officials and basically anybody that, that they don't like. Um, and they do things like uh, occupy wildlife nature preserves in Oregon. Yes, nice one. Nice, nice touch. And I gotta say, posse commentators sound totally like one of those punk rock groups that Brent right? likes. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I bought their album. <laughs> I have a quick question. 
because part of the sovereign citizenship, or at least for some some of the level of the sovereign citizen stuff, also includes that uh, we have to go back to maritime law. <laughs> where what is that connection? Because that's one of the parts where I'm just like. Now, because I'm like looking, going, okay, so it started with the farmers in the 80s. So where do we go back to maritime law? Okay, so so we don't actually go back to maritime law. Their argument is that the federal government is operating under maritime law. And so they'll say things like, they'll go into a court and they'll be like, I don't recognize the the legitimacy of this, of this court. And the judge will be like, what are you talking about? And their response is, you got gold tassels on your flag. That's what naval vessels have, and I'm not a ship. What? And then they get tased and, and dragged out. But like, like that's kind of their jam. Is so they argue that that they are, as uh, as Kevin was saying, they argue that they are are what what what's called flesh and blood persons, and a flesh and blood person uh, is subject only to natural law or to God made law. Oh, um, the corporate go. straw person. That's so. If you look at your passport and it says like Hodge, comma Edwin, uh, I mean, obviously yours won't, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Hodge, comma Edwin. That's the corporate straw man, and the government has used that fictional entity to uh, invest in the stock markets or take out loans from foreign governments or whatever. And an, a, a certain amount of an of the nation's wealth is attached to that corporate straw person. So they believe that if they can separate the flesh and blood person from the corporate straw man, they are now able to, so they can step apart. And now they, as the flesh and blood person, can sue the government to get access to that money. Uh, there's a, been a few cases in Canada where, um, where uh, uh, freemen on the land, sovereign citizens, have done this. They've tried to sue the government for like $11 billion or whatever. Um, <laughs> And they, uh, they try to sue because they argue that money's theirs. It belongs to their corporate straw person, which, is, which belongs to them. Wow. Real quick, um, you know, for the people out there that might not know, not me, not me, I totally know, but uh, what is maritime law? <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the law of the seas. Oh, it governs. Okay. Uh, it governs how uh, governs things like bills of the lading. It, it governs like uh, how ships are 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 uh, uh, treated in port, or how they're checked, or what flag they fly under. There's a whole different oh. kind. Sometimes it'll be called admiralty law. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, they they basically argue that uh, anytime you see a, a flag with like like fringe on it, uh, that's a naval ship, and therefore that court is operating under naval law, and because they're not a boat. Uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to them. That's so funny. Can we then yeah, only on a boat? Because I would be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a boat. Get Actually, access to that money. I'll be a boat. I'll be whatever. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> I was going to say what's interesting about that is my I have a relative in the Navy, and something we've kind of talked about, and like Navy bases, even if they are on land, I believe are still considered technically boats. Weird. <laughs> so there's, there's, well, because there is an admiral who will, who yeah. is in charge of the base and all of the operations on that base. So it is kind of a boat. So all we have to do is move all the courts onto naval bases and we'll be great. Or just turn <laughs> yeah. Canada into one giant naval base. I right. could, Perfect. We could work as long with as that. It's a US naval base. You know, it's it's semantics, you know. It's like, understandable <laughs> from a lay person's point of view. It's understandable how this could fool a normal lay, lay person because there are some things in life that we don't understand necessarily, right? The idea that, yes, when you do receive a letter from the government, everything's spelled in, in, in big letters for your name. Uh, and, for example, when you walk into a – you go outside of town and you get this little town that says unincorporated town of x you know it's unincorporated well why what does a town need to be corporated you know mm -hmm. and why is the town unincorporated so it's it's very easy for these people to, to to say yeah there's some truth to this because i see it right here in life yeah so what would you be your advice for some of these the lay person like ourselves that have no idea about all these laws and maritime laws and if brent leaves a ship or not so i mean here's here's the the million dollar question right because um a lot of the folks that buy into this so there's a bunch of different ways we can kind of understand them. Um, but, you know, and I, I don't mean to sound like an asshole, but uh, sociologically, when we look at, at folks like this, we, we 
can we talk to them we talk about them as low information low information citizens or low information people right and that is they're not dumb right they're not they're not dumb they're not stupid right they are uh they just lack cr a cr some critical information um and that that the ignorance of that particular you know thing an understanding of basics of the law or basics of like how the canadian legal system works or the canadian constitution works like the that ignorance is a it's a pit that they can fall into very easily they can be tripped up by mm -hmm. and the trick is to is, is to help them either convince them through argumentation which rarely works or lead them using sort of socratic question and answer kind of stuff lead them to a recognition that they don't actually know a whole lot and it might not be a good idea to trust some dude they found on the internet who said that if you just write your name in all capital letters uh you'll be able to free yourself from the gummit um <laughs> it's it's a really tricky thing because one of the the things that makes or allows these kinds of movements to thrive is is sort of low-key anti-intellectualism and I'm not saying like, you know, these are the people that are, you know, they're going to put the, the the teachers up against the wall when the revolution comes. They're just the ones who say things like, oh, yeah, that person, they sound like a know-it-all, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you sound like a know-it-all. Yeah. Or, yeah, that's, you know, that's, you, you've got some book learning, you know, you maybe you're book smart, but I'm street smart. It's like, well. Yeah. But everything oh, looks great from your ivory fucking tower, dude. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> the, the thing is, like, I, I sort of, I sort of use the the analogy of of the mechanic because uh, you know lots of these folks they they might not ever step foot in the university but they've damn sure been to a mechanic or, or something similar if your car if you're driving your car and it's making a weird knocking sound right who, who do you take it to do you take it to a mechanic someone that you know is a mechanic he says yeah i'm a mechanic here's all my mechanic my she's my red seal here's you know i'm i'm a mechanic or do you take it to jerry up the street who's never really held with those like elitist mechanical schools, but he can sure <laughs> tell you that the knocking in your car comes from the fucking gremlin that's living in that, that twirly bit in the bottom, right? Like there's a fundamental difference in information. Some information's really good and some is bad. And some people tend to know a bit more than others. It's not a sign of weakness or indoctrination to trust someone who knows more. But that distrust is hard baked into these kinds of ideologies. So like, you know, the question, how do you reach them? I can't because of who I am. Oh, you got a PhD? Oh, you got some fucking book learning? I'm not gonna listen to you, right? Yeah. Right. We've all yeah. dealt with them. You see all these professors from UV driving around with their Ferraris. Eh? They're all yeah. over the place. Eh? You can tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my Ferrari, my my almost twenty-year-old sedan. <laughs> that books I see behind you there, huh? Huh? Uh -huh. Books, <laughs> books. You get books. <laughs> On my Walmart bookshelves. Yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We uh, we sociologists, we're just raking in that fat, fat dough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and one thing, it seems like you know, if they can find some type of uh question right if they did like like you said like they just say somebody tells them that hey that oh did you know the law actually means this they put that information that they got from that guy on the same level as if it's equal to as valid as the yes. actual information coming out of scholarship yeah and that is just god damn that's frustrating so it's, it's it's frustrating but it's understandable um, this is, this is one of the things that I, I tell my students all the time. Like we can, we can like make fun of these guys all day long. I mean, they give us ammunition every time they open their mouths, yeah. Yeah. but the other way we can look at them is we can say, look, a lot of this information, especially these days comes through social media yep. and the information that comes in is so fast and there's so much of it that you have to make snap decisions constantly to filter through that information we have more we have access to more bits and pieces of information in a, in a day than our parents had in their whole lifetimes right and we have had to adapt now some people the naive ones like to think oh we've just evolved so that we can process information faster we actually can't uh and so what we do instead is we develop heuristics right little mental shortcuts 
that let us filter through information rapidly. And the most common heuristic we have is, does that thing agree with something I already believe? Mm. If yes, it's more ver it's more real to me. It's more, it's, it's a fact. And so you find people who maybe they're a little anti-authoritarian anyways, which fine, you know, like when I was younger, I was super anti-authoritarian. I'm still kind of anti-authoritarian, but which is harder being authority in a classroom. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a paradox. I, I walk every day, such as my burden, but yeah. we, you know, when, when we are, are given these, these bits of information, if we're already kind of leaning against like the government is untrustworthy, yeah. we are more likely to accept that information, right? It's sort of classic confirmation bias. We're more likely to accept that information, but once we accept it, we start closing the doors on the outsides of our information sort of ecosystem. We start closing off pathways in that network to the, to the stuff that we think now is a little more radical. So we start moving slowly down this funnel of radicalization. And the farther we go, the longer we go, the more we start cutting out information we don't agree with. And then eventually we get to a point where we stop cutting out bits of information. We start cutting out whole ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. right. right. So, so that's kind of like with the flat earthers, they have to like uh, say that space doesn't exist, right? Exactly. That space isn't real because they hold the flat earth thing as a conclusion. And then anybody that says, okay, but what about this? You know, they go, oh, well, that's not real. Because yeah. yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. It's just like the, the fact that they're having to deny the reality uh, causes them or because of, that they accept this belief, they'll have to deny the reality because that's how it's going to have to work. One, it's yeah. one or the other. And you yeah. get to a certain point where, where in order to deny that reality, you don't just have to like stop listening to one person, right? So it's not like, oh yeah, I got to stop listening to that one professor who keeps talking shit about my beliefs. Instead, it's all professors from that department or that discipline are all e equally bullshit. So now, in order to, to maintain the schema, the worldview that you have, you just eliminate that whole branch of knowledge. And then you can go a little wow. bit deeper. And now it's all academics are all they're all bad. You should eliminate all of them. Where do you get your information? Joe fucking Rogan. Um, <laughs> and, and, yeah. I mean, once you're there, you're lost. Like if, if you look at Joe Rogan and go, that's a man I need to listen to. <laughs> yeah. I would suggest yeah. humbly that you stop, reassess your life choices uh, <laughs> and maybe oh, go to a monastery for a while, just, just for, for a bit. spa, whatever, just and sit on a mountaintop <laughs> somewhere, just get away. Well, Put on left at the valley instead. How about there we you go? That, you know, <laughs> we're we're more credible. Anyway. But it, it's amazing how how we're seeing these uh, these sovereign uh, citizens uh, conspiracy essentially snowball into something bigger and bigger. Where is the movement now? If, if uh, as an expert, where do you see them now? I mean, are they really getting back to their roots, or are they really expanding to other conspiracies? Where are they now? Whoa. Uh they are. <laughs> they're colonizing. No. So they are uh, the sovereign citizens uh, in the, the 90s and early 2000s. You could mostly find them ar around sort of the paranoid edges of the far right. Uh, you could find them at like gun shows, right? You'd find them at gun shows or at uh, shooting ranges or veteran halls. Like you'd find them in places where you would expect to find right wing thinkers um, of a particular anti government bent. These days, you can find their rhetoric on uh, health sites, mm. yoga blogs, and mom blogs. Uh, you can actually find this stuff. Uh, it, it's, there's a, a term from another conspiracy theory that we, we call pastel QAnon, which is this. Like it that. is the framing of, of a certain conspiratorial belief system to appeal to women. And sovereign citizens and freemen on the land are beginning to do that too. But they're also welding their ideology to the anti-vax and anti-mask movement. Oh, God. Because the, the sovereign citizen movement doesn't have a lot of traction. It's fringe. It's wildly obscure and arcane and weird. But tons of people are vaccine hesitant. And tons of people don't like mask mandates. Well... Now the sovereign citizens movement is giving them the language to, to, in their minds, fight back. And this is why we're starting to see vaccine anti-vax movements or anti-vax groups um, issuing like notices of vaccine liability. Yes. Yes. Um, 
This is, uh, this are, these are what are called quasi-legal ar arguments, uh, and they are the bread and butter of the sovereign citizens movement. But now we're seeing it in the anti-vax movement too, because it, it, it's a, a language that already appeals to them, right? It's anti-government, it's free thinking, it's, you know, you, you got it off Facebook. But it also has the the aesthetics of law, right? It looks legalist, legalese, or right, right? It looks sort of legal, so it really appeals to them. Wow. So, oh, I was gonna say, is it right if I ask a question? Too quick. Yeah, go, go, for it. It. go for it. Yeah. Okay, because this this actually kind of goes back a little bit more to the past of this, because I, I have an interest in conspiracy theories and stuff, and a lot of them always seem to stem from things like the Protocols of Zion. It does the sovereign citizen theories do those also tie back to that as well yeah um jeez i mean I what's the right maybe wing there was one that was right. <laughs> just what's, one what's a far-right conspiracy theory without a little bit of anti-semitism right. um, <laughs> yeah so so uh early early sovereigns especially in the the so-called sagebrush rebellion which was in the 70s and, and early 80s um these these early proto sovereigns and then the early sovereign citizens one of their biggest enemies has always been the internationalists, international bankers, globalists, right? These are all dog whistles for the Jews, right? For Jewish wow. folk and for Judaism. Um, sometimes they'll say the quiet part out loud and they'll call it like uh, international Zionism or international Khazarism. Um, it's, yeah, they, you know, it sounds more sciencey, I guess. But, um, <laughs> It, again, it's all about aesthetics, right? And, and I don't mean like things that are pretty. I mean aesthetics, the look of a thing. Yep. Um, and a lot of what they do is about the aesthetics of a thing. And so like it's, yeah, so international Khazarism, it looks more academic, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. But yeah. um, <laughs> they want to look academic without being it. Yeah. Well, this, uh... but, but yes. <laughs> okay. So can I, can I do a little bit of theory for you? Yes. By all means, please. please do. Let's talk about a little guy named Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault is, among other things, uh, was a brilliant thinker. Um, and if you've ever read his work and gone, this guy's really hard to understand. It's because he wrote most of his work high. Um, <laughs> dude was, he was, he really liked morphine, uh, is what I'm saying. So anyways, he basically argued. He says, you know that old, that old expression, knowledge is power? He says, yeah, but literally. Um, no, knowledge emerges from relations of power, right? It's deeply implicated in relations of power. So to know something is to is to, to to sort of to have power is to manifest power. When we uh, when we look at experts, right? We we have a society that's built on sort of the the uh, built on the legacy of the Enlightenment. Everything's about reason, rationality. Um, that which is known is that which can be observed, tested, confirmed. Right. So that's the only thing that's known. Foucault says, yeah, but it's more than that. It's not just that the only thing that can be knowledge or is science it's that anything that doesn't look like science is immediately devalued as other right so faith obviously can't be knowledge uh revelation can't be knowledge uh self-reflection can't be knowledge emotions can't be knowledge this is why we get the facts versus feelings even though that's bullshit um <laughs> yeah. but foucault says once you construct this kind of society all that all power the only thing that can have influence, the only thing that can have power are things that, that fit the ideals that we've constructed, right? Um, it's, it, it's more complex than that, but here we are. They don't, these folks don't, they distrust folks in power, but they recognize that they have it, that they have that power. So if they can construct an alternative framework, an alternative discourse, right? A different system of knowledge, facts, power, and value, there now they can compete on the same level. And that's where we are right now, right? We have experts and we have non-experts. My, my understanding, my knowledge comes from a decade or almost two decades now of, of a formal academic study and research. Somebody else's knowledge, their understanding comes from watching, binge watching 15 seasons of Ancient Aliens and some YouTube channels. Yeah, they're like I was. I was watching Alex Jones before everybody, you know, before exactly. Before, you know. <laughs> but because we're in this weird space where anti-intellectualism is everywhere, expertise and pseudo expertise, they don't just kind of exist in the same space. For Foucault, 
they seem to be equal because they're both influential. They're both displaying mm. the same patterns of power, which is why like we might look at, at someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene and be like, how the hell can anybody believe what she's saying? And the truth is people believe her because they make very little distinction between sort of academic, empirical, rigorous, sort of enlightenment style knowledge and pseudo knowledge constructed through this different kind of, of, of sort of knowledge production scheme. Anyways, that's just some fun theory for you. No, I, I, I love it. I, I, I was also wondering, is that also why you see like these sovereign citizens, for example, they'll say, we don't want to participate in society when it's something bad, but when it's an advantage, like a monetary advantage, they're more than happy to take it. It, it feels like guerrilla warfare, you know? It's like you, you, you don't want to be part of the big army, but you'll shoot them and use their guns against them. You know? Oh, yeah, no. They're they're very pragmatic. Um, yeah, they, they don't want to be a part of society, you know, when it, when it, uh, when it uh, infringes on what they perceive their rights to be. Um, but they have no problem using public roads and hospitals and schools, although increasingly sovereigns and freemen on the land uh, don't use schools. They want to pull their kids into homeschooling. And sovereign ideas really make the rounds in a lot of, of, of homeschool networks. Not all of them, right? Some are totally legit homeschool networks, but others, especially in the United States, um, exist on the kinds of fringes of, say, Christian and uh, and even secular societies. And in those spaces, those ideas get passed around a lot. Is, is, the, is par, uh, part of the sovereign citizen, is it the belief that you don't have to pay taxes? That is that That's part of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not only do you not have to pay taxes, but the government owes you. <laughs> yeah, and you're right, because I about like the it, it kind of uh, crossing these lines, because I was I go to a, a, a Kratom shop, it's like a kava bar, you know, and they mm -hmm. sell you all these different herbs. They got healing crystals, you know, they got yeah. shirts that say I, I am an eternal being and things like that. And the dude just starts going off about how, you know, you really don't have to pay taxes according to the Constitution. And I'm like, really, you, man, like. I figured you were just some pothead that was like, you know, you know, but I never would have thought that it would go to that. I always imagine like right wing, you know, that sort of thing, but it's crazy. This is, this is where things get really, really dicey, right? Is, is these old right wing distinctions, they kind of fall apart uh, when we study these movements. Um, now I'm not for one minute, I'm not advocating this sort of bullshit horseshoe theory crap like that's a that's a, that is, that is its, itself a not particularly well supported political theory what i'm saying is that the right left distinction is good uh for like talking about con traditional politics right because traditional political parties organize themselves along that spectrum but these movements begin to dissolve and break apart and get very very fuzzy around the edges uh such that uh we actually see these kinds of fringe beliefs becoming increasingly nonpartisan. It's it's not about your political affiliation anymore. Um, it's about your position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, governmentality in general, like just the idea of being governed. Um, anarchists can hold these views. Uh, even uh, some 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 democratic socialists will hold some of these views. Uh, and one of the, the the sort of the easier ways to think about this, or, or a better example, is um, look at the 9/11 Truth Movement. That started as a left-wing movement, uh, but it isn't anymore, right? We've moved into what a lot of scholars call a postmodern uh, information economy. Uh, that is, these old ways of understanding things just don't, the old models don't hold. And so it makes it hard for us to predict how these things will change or grow or who will adapt to them, like who will, 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 will join them. Wow. So the whole thing with the dissolving of the, the two parties within these conspiracies and stuff. Um, do you think that kind of has come together with the QAnon movement or was that happening before the QAnon movement? It was happening before QAnon, but QAnon is like, if, if conspiracy theories are Pokemon, QAnon is, is, is the ultimate form of any one of them, right? It's, it's like Q QAnon is this ultimate apotheosis of this kind of attitude, this kind of ideology. It, it started as a pro-Trump, right? MAGA, 
you know, we're going to storm the, we're going to storm the, the, the capital kind of thing. But um, by now, right, December 2021, January 2022, it's nonpartisan, right? There people all across the spectrum, people from all walks of life, all economic classes, all ethnic demographics, all age brackets, all education levels, there is no predictive variable to determine who's going to be in QAnon because everybody is, right? It's one of those things. It's we can't even estimate its numbers. Certainly the people that buy into it, at least a couple of its ideas, we're talking the tens of millions. Uh, I was yeah. going to say, it's that part of it too. It's just the factor that it is so wide. It, it's like the ultimate Hydra where it has so many heads that it's like, okay, well, what counts as an actual QAnon person? Is it just the children piece or does it have to be the children and JFK Jr.? Yeah, Exactly. Um, there's a, a, a way of thinking about social networks, uh, how information propagates. Um, traditionally, when we look at, at, at how information propagates through a social network, we can draw some pretty easy, we could used to be able to draw these really easy maps, right? Family, the family was this information production network. The children sort of grew out of that family and they would move to new locations, establish a new family, which would create new sort of nodes for information distribution. These days, when we look at how information gets transmitted through these networks, it's what we call rhizomatic. It, it means that there's no beginning, there's no end. It's, think of like a root system, like grass or fungus. It's so interconnected that there are no big nodes anymore. There are countless tiny nodes. Every single one of them receives and generates information and spreads it through them through their own networks it's it's yeah the idea that there's like oh we got to find the leader of QAnon. no yeah there is no leader of QAnon. It doesn't exist it doesn't it's exist yeah and people like like uh oh, oh shoot what's her name didulo the uh uh the so-called queen of canada uh, yes a, yeah oh. Yeah. She she's QAnon, but she's also espousing sovereign and Freeman ideology, and she's espousing like Wakefield esque anti vax ideologies and nine eleven and flat Earth and all these other things. And now that she's you know she's you know the, the government the you know the, the the police raided her home and they took a bunch of her electronics and they took her in for a psyche val and she passed and went oh. back out. Um, oh, someone else will just pop up somewhere else. Or at least that node simply becomes a little bit more influential until yep. it dies off and another one becomes more influential. It's it's just this this Gordian knot of of, of, of information. Yeah. So if if, one, oh, sorry, go for it. Yeah, I was gonna say if there's one thing with QAnon that I found fascinating, it is just how they absorb and copy things from all over. I have a very big interest in the satanic panic and that whole save the children. I'm like, you basically copy pasted the the we believe the children 100% only, yeah. only now you don't have actual children so nobody can actually check anything <laughs> no it's somebody's uncle's nephew's brother's cousin's girlfriend's former roommate which <laughs> <you know? laughs> I love that reference I got that reference <laughs> <That was> good <laughs> uh, please pause oh. <laughs> uh, so um, Dr. Hodge uh, if if we go back to Michel Foucault there, and you were saying you know the the you got informed society on one side and get get misinformed society on the other side and they've come to equal power. What if the misinformed side actually ends up, for like another term, winning? And you take a country like the United States where the majority of the population becomes like that misinformed. What does that mean in in your opinion? Economically uh, speaking. I mean I'd like to say we're screwed, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean I, I I don't want to be that doomsayer, but it's not a what if they win, it's they did. Yeah, they did win. Like the enlightenment is over. There is no one like it's over um, from from a theoretical perspective, from an empirical perspective. Yeah. Um, most sociologists have, have basically acknowledged that the, the age of the enlightenment is done. We're in something new um, like post modernity, new risk modernity, liquid modernity, whatever. But but think about it. The world is literally on fire. Yeah. Are we doing anything about it? No, no. It's getting worse. Yeah. Like we know that we know that trickle down economics, supply side economics, voodoo economics, we know that it doesn't work. Has anybody stopped using it? No, they keep no. using it. Austerity. 
It doesn't work, but we still use it. Donald Trump won the presidency, right? <laughs> uh, a, a man who could not be more ignorant of the world, you know, short of being dead. There are very few people, that, there's no one who's more ignorant about the world than he is, and yet he won. And he didn't just win by a little. 70 something million people followed it, right? Yeah. The, 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 the side of, of low information has won. Uh, and, and that's where we are. And the sooner that we realize that and start thinking about how to strategize and how to, how to push back against that, one of the great failings of the left is that we stopped innovating. We stopped coming up with new ideas. Yeah. We said, we won the culture wars in the 80s. We won. Feminism, uh, uh, feminism changed the world for, for women. No, it didn't. It changed the world for white, straight, cis, middle-class women. Um, if, you know, uh, uh, gay rights happened. Yeah, well, it, it, it happened for white, cis men first, and then everyone else was sort of pulled into it. But things really haven't gotten a lot better for, for pretty much anybody else. Uh, queer folk are, are still marginalized. Trans folk are still disproportionately victimized. But my point is, all of the all of the, the 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 things that the Enlightenment promised, right? Emancipation, liberation, egalite, fraternity, that never really happened. And now we're in something new where it seems that so much of our policy and so many of our, so many of our the, the things that we that are guiding us or governing our, our our decisions don't come from a place of reason. They come from a place of of reaction, fear, rage, uh, anxiety. Uh, and so the left seeded that ground, right? We we said, to, oh, we won everything we won. We don't have to do anything. Let's just laugh at those conservatives, laugh at their silly little purity balls, laugh at their silly little big tent revivals, laugh at them, uh, laugh at them as they, as they start trying to convince us that the world is 6,000 years old. How'd that work out for us? <laughs> right? That's a great point. That is a great point. Yeah. Wow. That is one hell of a conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott, for coming on the show today and explaining all that to us. But, but before I let you go, actually, one quick little question. Uh, this, this kind of finish on a bit of a darker side. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> reality, you're exposing reality here. So, so, so for us as a lay person, what can we do to maybe start bucking the trend, trying to reverse things? The lay person out there who hears us here talking about this right now, what can they do to try to make things better on the local level for themselves? Two things. One, recognize that time isn't linear, right? That, that progress isn't linear. Mm -hmm. Things have taken a dark turn. That's not forever. It's for as long as we allow it to persist. Right. So we can change things. We can push back. We can make things better, but we actually have to put in the work. We can't mm -hmm. rest on our laurels. We can't sit back and be like, haha, those silly, those silly creationists, they're teaching our kids right now. We need to become teachers. We need to become lawyers and doctors and scholars. We need to, and we need to, to, to take what we learn, take all of our skills and push them back out into the world. We need to come up with ideas that inspire people and make them want to believe in us again, make them want to join us, right? Because right now, like, look, look at the NDP. The NDP are, are so terrified of being called democratic socialists, that they're running to the center of the map. But yeah. the Same ideas point. that they had when they were democratic socialists were good ideas. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Why are they afraid of them? Why are, we so, why are we so embarrassed or afraid? Why don't we just say what we believe and show people how, that, how it works? So that's the one thing. At the local level, it means getting involved. Mm -hmm. It means actually going out and talking. Um, you know, there's a guy in Kelowna, uh, David Crawford, he, uh, if you've ever seen this dude on the news, he's the guy that all the anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers stand on one side of the road and he stands on the other side of the road with a, a sign that says, yay vaccines, yay science. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know love... exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, he gets dunked on all the time. He gets shouted at, harassed, he gets spat at, he gets screamed at, he gets threatened all the time. Do you know what he does? He gets his ass up the next morning and he goes back out and he does it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a young woman in, in Victoria, she can't be more than 21, 22 years old. And when the anti-vaxxers and the sovsits are down on the, the ledge 
uh, lawns screaming about their rights. She's standing right there. She doesn't engage with them, but she's holding a sign. She's standing right there. She's doing it. Um, and that's inspiring. It brings other people. It causes them to come out and want to do it. So we have to start doing that again. we got to rediscover uh, what it means to truly be activists. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, that is a great way to end the show. Thank you so much, Professor Hodge. I really, really appreciate that. If people want to find out more about what you do at the University of uh, UVic and your research, where can they find you? Well, that's the thing. I keep a pretty low profile, but I okay. do have a Twitch channel uh, that I, I talk nice. sociology and play video games on Saturday nights. Uh, it's called Sociocalypse. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, on starting, uh, starting on Tuesday, uh, I'm doing a, a, night, a stream every Tuesday night where I'll be watching things like ancient aliens, uh, ancient aliens and uh, conspiratorial movies and giving hot takes and sort of showing where they fall apart and why they don't work. Oh, that that's sounds awesome. awesome. That's I'm all sorry? On. That's all on Twitch? It's all on Twitch. Perfect. Fantastic. Awesome. Fantastic. Professor Hodge, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We will bring you back, guarantee. We love you already. You're part of the family. Before I let you go, i got to have you say, hi, this is Professor Edward Hodge of US University of Victoria, and I took a left at the valley. <laughs> hi, this is Professor Edwin Hodge. I'm from the University of, Vic of Victoria, and I took a left at the valley. Fantastic. Perfect. And that was Professor Edwin Hodge of UVic. Oh, my God. Love him. What a great guy. Yeah, no kidding. What? I just love the guy's energy. I yeah. just love that. I mean, he was just like on point. The plethora of information we got from this. You oh know his, my gosh. Your ass off at oh, every class man. he's in. We will bring oh, him hell yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to take classes with him. That would be you so too, great. Right. So far oh, away. Man. You know, I'm just, it's just Adopt great. me. Adopt me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we brought such high caliber guests on this show. You know, mm -hmm. was Professor Joel Back and Professor... Hector Garcia, Dr. Yep. Hector Gar Garcia, and you know now Mr. Uh, Professor Hodge, and et cetera, et cetera. And we got so many of them, and it's fantastic to hear mm -hmm. them come like that. And it's, I love the advice he has for us because it's the kind of advice we've been talking about on the show for a long time. Even something like the atheist movement, I've talked a lot about the apatheist. You know, the ones that say, mm -hmm. "Well, we have the truth on our side; we don't need to do anything." No, and we've said this over and over again. They never stop on the other side. They never stop. They never give up. Right. And as the professor said there, they've essentially won. Why? Because of apathy. And yeah. it's, a, it's, it's yeah. a big thing to take from this episode. If there's anything you need to take from this episode is you need to get involved as before so it gets way worse. Especially on the local levels, because that's where a lot of this stuff is being pushed through is on the state level. It's on those county levels where they can try and sneak something in. A state legislator does not have a ton of time. A lot of these organizations will come in with a bill completely laid out and ready to go. And so all they have to do is bring it to the front. And right now in Minnesota, we're, our house is blue, but our Senate's red. So, you know, depending on where we want to go with that depends on where, <laughs> who's feeling what. Yeah. And, it's not fun. It's not voting. a fun place yeah. to be. <laughs> no, no. no. And we've, we've seen this a, a lot of times. Uh, well, you see it happening right now as we speak. Uh, you know, the, 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 the school districts are taken over by the, by the right. Uh, the, the, the parents' associations, all these little things, they know. They know that's where the power resides. We have a tendency to always focus on the, the presidential election or the federal level and, or the state level. No, 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 no. It's at your local level where it happens. This is where it happens. And this is where the right understands. And this is where they're trying to take over. And they're successfully doing it at this point. Why? Because we can't be bothered, apparently, here on the left to get off our ass and yeah. actually do something about it. But we need to. We really, really, really need to. Yeah. All the way down the ballot on both sides. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Hey. Judges, hey. judges is so important. Yeah, yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that it's a little bit, of, a little bit of work. You got to look up uh, some stuff for judges, but it's, it's worth it. Even, it's not that bad though. Like I've done it a few times. They usually have a website. There's usually at minimum a website where you can look up what what are they campaigning about, and it's like okay, are they going to say agree with everything? Probably not. Can I at least get 75%? Great. 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, guys, for being on the show, and thank you for listening, and thank you to Professor Hodge for being our guest, and thank you to my co host Sabrina, Brantley, and Hertzie, and even Benjamin, even though he's not here today. Yeah. <laughs> you can follow us at leftatvalley.ca. You can send us an email at leftatvalley at outlook.com. You can do or find us on Facebook on facebook.com slash Left of the Valley. Mm -hmm. You can find us on uh, Twitter at LEPD Podcast. You can on find you us on YouTube. At YouTube slash Left of the Valley. Perfect. Uh, what am I missing? Uh, uh, Patreon. Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash LEPD and become a patron to help us grow the show. Give us a five-star review where you find us. It helps us and helps others find the show. Uh, Bradley, what do we got coming up there? Uh, so, yeah. You, uh, come uh, and check out Unapologetics panel stream on YouTube. Yep. Um, and then also, I'm doing these uh, little uh, streaming on Twitch. It's Skeptic Brantley, if you want to watch that. Um, Ooh, so it's a lot okay. of fun. What games are you playing on Twitch? <laughs> oh, I just I go through uh, videos. I do. Oh, just like more, video. okay. just yeah. more <laughs> videos. Okay. Yeah. Reaction videos. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> coming up, we'll have Tracy Harris and Jen Belk to be talking about their new show. We'll be yep. coming next week. We have our old oh, friend yeah. Bernard Labarel, who'll be coming back to talk about his new book. And we're also talking to, with Andrew Seidel of the uh, talk about law and atheism and all that coming down the yes. pipe as well. Nice. So, oh, yeah. We have some more fun stuff coming down. We do. Excellent. Anything else any time? Have a great week. Sounds good. Don't get COVID. Don't get COVID. Protect yourself. <laughs> get vaccinated. Has your wash. Use your masks. Use your masks. <laughs> they all work, babe. Thank you so much. <laughs> Until next time. See you next week. Skeptic and non-believer, an infidel, a heathen, I call it how I see it.